Chapter 1. The Saint. Once you finish your milk, please put the carton back in the box. Make sure you return it to the space with your number on it and then get back to your desk. It looks like everyone is just about done. Since today is the last day of the school year, we will also be marking the end of milk time. Thanks to all of you for participating. I also heard some of you wondering whether the program would be continuing next year, but I can tell you now that it won't. This year, we were designated as a model middle school for the health ministry's campaign to promote dairy products. We were asked to have each of you drink a carton of milk every day, and now we're looking forward to the annual school physicals in April to see whether your height and bone mass come in above the national averages. Yes, I suppose you could say that we've been using you as guinea pigs, and I'm sure this year wasn't very pleasant for those of you who are lactose intolerant or who simply don't like milk. But the school was randomly selected for the program, and each classroom was supplied with the daily milk cartons and the box to hold them, with cubby holes for your carton to identify each of you by seat number, and it's true that we've kept track of who drank the milk and who didn't. But why should you be making faces now when you were drinking the milk happily enough a few minutes ago? What's wrong with being asked to drink a little milk every day? You're about to enter puberty. Your bodies will be growing and changing, and you know drinking milk helps build strong bones. But how many of you actually drink it at home? And the calcium is good for more than just your bones. You need it for the proper development of your nervous system. Low levels of calcium can make you nervous and jumpy. It's not just your bodies that are growing and changing. I know what you've been up to. I hear the stories. You, Mr. Wittenab, you grew up in a family that owns an electronics shop, and I know you've figured out how to remove most of the pixelation on adult videos. You've been passing them along to the other boys. You're growing up. Your minds are changing as quickly as your bodies. I know that wasn't the best example, but what I mean is, you're entering what we sometimes call the rebellious period. It's a time when boys and girls tend to be touchy, to be hurt or offended by the least little thing, and when they're easily influenced by their environment. You'll begin to imitate everyone and everything around you as you try to figure out who you are. If you're honest, I suspect many of you will recognize these changes in yourselves already. You've just seen a good example. Up until a few moments ago most of you thought of your free milk as a benefit. But now that I've told you it was an experiment, your feelings about the milk have suddenly changed. Am I right? Still, there's nothing to odd about that it's human nature to change your mind, and not just in puberty. In fact, the teachers have been saying that your class is actually a good bit calmer and better behaved than the usual group. Maybe we have the milk to thank for that. But I have something more important I wanted to tell you today. I wanted you to know that I'll be retiring at the end of the month. No, I'm not moving to a new school, I'm retiring as a teacher. Which means that you're the last students I'll ever teach, and I'll remember you for as long as I live. Settle down now. I appreciate your response, especially those of you who actually sound as though you're sorry to hear I'm leaving. What? Am I resigning because of what happened? Yes, I suppose so and I'd like to take some time today to talk to you about that. Now that I'm retiring, I've been thinking again about what it's meant to me to be a teacher. I didn't enter this profession for any of the usual reasons, because I myself had a wonderful teacher who changed my life or anything like that. I suppose you could say I became a teacher simply because I grew up in a very poor family. From the time I was little, my parents told me they could never afford to send me to college and that it would have been a waste to send a girl anyway. But I suppose that made me want to go all the more. I loved school and I was a good student. When the time came, I received a scholarship perhaps because I was so poor and enrolled at the National University in my hometown. I studied science, my favorite subject, and I started teaching at a cram school even before I graduated. Now I know you all complain about cram school, having to go right home from the regular school day to hurry through supper and run off to more classes that last late into the evening. 
but I've always thought you were incredibly lucky to have parents who cared enough to give you that extra opportunity. At any rate, when I reached my senior year I decided to forego graduate school which might have been my first choice and get a job as a teacher. I liked the fact that it was a secure career with a stable income, but there was an even bigger factor, the terms of my scholarship required me to repay the tuition money if I did not become a teacher. So without so much as a second thought, I took the test to obtain my license. Now I know this may cause some of you to question my motives for becoming a teacher, but I can assure you I have always tried to do the very best job I could. Lots of people fritter away their lives complaining that they were never able to find their true calling. But the truth is that most of us probably don't even have one. So what's wrong, then, with deciding on the thing that's right in front of you and doing it wholeheartedly? That's what I did, and I have no regrets. Now, some of you may be wondering why I chose to teach middle school rather than high school. I guess you could say that I wanted to be on the front lines, so to speak. I wanted to teach students who were still in the middle of their compulsory education. High school students have the option of quitting, so their attention can be divided. I wanted to work with students who were still completely committed to their education, who had no other choice that was as close to a true calling as I could find. It may be hard to believe, but there was a time when I was passionate about this work. Mr. Tanaka and Mr. Rogawa, there's nothing particularly funny about that part of my story. I became a teacher in 1998, and my first position on the job training, really, was at M Middle School. I was the three years and then took a leave of absence for a year before coming here to S Middle School. I found I enjoyed being away from the bigger cities in the prefecture, and this has been a pleasant, relaxed place to work. This is my fourth year here, so I've worked as a teacher for only seven years total. I know you've been curious about a middle school. Mosa Yoshi Sakurinami teaches there, and you've probably seen him on TV recently. Please settle down, everyone. Is he that famous? Do I know him? Well, we worked together for three years, so I suppose you could say I do, but in those days he wasn't such a celebrity. They've made him out to be a super teacher, and he's in the news so often that I suspect you know more about him than I do. What's that? You don't know the story, Mr. Moakawa? Don't you watch TV? All right, I'll tell you. Sakurinami was the leader of a gang when he was in middle school, and when he was a sophomore in high school he assaulted a teacher. He was expelled and left the country, and for the next few years he apparently wandered around the world doing all sorts of dangerous things and getting into trouble. He witnessed war and other violent conflicts, and he lived among people suffering from extreme poverty. From those experiences, he came to realize the error of his ways and regret his violent past. He returned to Japan, passed his high school equivalency test, and entered a prestigious university. After graduating, he became a middle school English teacher. It's said that he chose to teach middle school because he wanted to help students avoid the kinds of mistakes he had made when he was that age. A few years ago he started spending his evenings in the video game centers and bookstores where students get into trouble after school. He would seek them out one by one, talking to them about self-respect and offering them a chance to start over. He was so persistent he acquired the nickname Mr. Second Chance, and they even made a TV documentary about him. He published books and expanded the scope of his work, trying to reach more students. What's that? You heard all that on TV last week. Well, my apologies to those of you who already know the story. What? You're right, I left out an important point. At the end of last year, when Sakurinami was barely 33 years old, His doctor told him he had only a few months to live. But instead of feeling sorry for himself, he decided to devote his remaining time to his students. So now they've given him a new nickname, The Saint. You seem to know all about it, Mr. Abe. What's that? Do I admire Sakurinami? Do I want to be like him? Those are tricky questions. I suppose you could say I want to learn from his life, but only the latter half. But I can see what an impression he's made on some of you.
and it makes me realize that I may have been an inadequate teacher in certain ways, especially compared to someone with his total dedication. As I said before, when I first became a teacher I wanted to do the best job I could. If one of my students had a problem, I would ignore my lesson plan and try to get the class to solve it together. If a student ran out of the room, even right in the middle of class, I would go after him. But at some point I started to realize that no one is perfect, me least of all. And when you tell a young person something with all the authority of a teacher, you actually risk amplifying the trouble. I began to feel that there was nothing more self-indulgent and foolish than forcing my opinions on my students. In the end, I worried I was simply condescending to the very people I should have been respecting and trying to help. So after my leave of absence, when I started work here at S Middle School, I laid down a couple of new ground rules for myself. First, I decided I would always address my students politely and use Mr. and Miss before their names. And second, I would treat them as equals. These seem like small things, but you'd be surprised how many students noticed right away. Noticed what, you ask? I suppose they noticed how it made them feel to be treated with respect. You hear so much about abusive families that you might think that all children are being persecuted at home. But the truth is that most children these days are coddled and spoiled. Their parents bow and scrape and beg them to study to eat their supper, whatever. Which may be why children show so little respect in return, why they talk to adults in the same tone of voice they use with their friends. And a lot of teachers even play up to this, consider it a badge of honor to be given a nickname or to be addressed informally by their students in class. That's what they see on TV, after all, with all those shows about popular teachers who are buddies to their students. I'm sure you know how the plot goes, a popular teacher has trouble with one particular class, but out of the conflict a deep trust develops between them. And when the end credits roll, the rest of the school and the teachers of the classes have vanished and it's as though the teachers therefore that one group of troublemakers alone. Even in class, the TV teacher talks about his personal life and delves into the problem student's most intimate feelings. Do the rest of you want to hear all this? Oh yes, of course we do. Then some serious student gathers the courage to ask about the meaning of life. And then the drivel continues. In the last scene, the serious student usually ends up apologizing to the troublemaker for having been insensitive. Which might be fine for TV, but how about in real life? Have any of you ever had a personal issue that seemed so pressing that you wanted to interrupt class to talk about it? There's too great an emphasis placed on the sheep gone astray. Personally, I have more respect for the serious student, the one who never got into trouble in the first place. But those kids never get the starring roles, either on TV or in real life. It's enough to make the well-behaved student doubt the value of his efforts. People often talk about the sense of trust that develops between a teacher and her students. When my students started getting cell phones, I began to receive text messages saying things like, I want to die, or, I have no reason to live, cries for help. They often came in the middle of the night, 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, and I have to admit I was tempted to ignore them. But of course I never could. That would have been betraying our sense of trust. Of course, teachers also started getting much more malicious messages. A young male teacher got a text asking for his help. The sender said her friend was in trouble and asked him to come to the entrance of a seedy hotel in the center of town. Now, you might think he should have been a little more cautious, but he was young and earnest and he hurried off to help only to be photographed with the girl in the compromising location. Her parents showed up at the school the next day, the police got involved, and it turned into a major incident. His fellow teachers knew, of course that the poor fellow had simply been tricked. We knew because he had told us that he was transgender. He had been born with the body of a man but he was actually a woman. Even under these circumstances, however, we saw no reason to reveal the truth. The young man himself, however, was determined to defend his honor as a teacher, and he ended up telling his students and their parents. But this whole tragedy and the disastrous outcome for the teacher had started from almost nothing. 
from a student's hurt feelings at having been told to stop talking during class. What? Was the student ever punished? Of course not. On the contrary, the teacher and the school were blamed. How could they expose impressionable young people to sexual deviants? Or gays? Or even single mothers like myself? The parents ignored what their own daughter had done and blamed the school, and in the end they won. Though I'm not sure it's ever appropriate to talk about winners and losers in a situation like this. The teacher. He was transferred last year and teaches at another school now, as a woman. I know it's an extreme example, but these kinds of accusations get made all the time, and for male teachers they're very difficult to disprove. Since that incident, we've made it a policy to have a female teacher go in place of a male teacher when he has to meet with a female student, and vice versa. That's also why we have two male and two female teachers for each grade. If one of you boys were to ask me to meet you somewhere, I would immediately get in touch with Tokura Sensei from the A class and ask him to go in my place. And if something happened involving a girl from the A class, Tokura Sensei would contact me. You hadn't realized. There was never an announcement made, but we thought you'd figure it out for yourselves. So now you boys are probably wondering whether it's even worth contacting me when you're really in trouble if Tokura Sensei is going to show up anyway. What's that, Mr. Hasagawa? Yes, I remember when you had that problem in gym class. You told me it was serious, but in the bigger scheme of things it was quite minor. In fact, I doubt it's more than a few times a year when one of you really needs me. I'm sure when you text me saying you want to die, you truly believe on some level that life has no meaning, as you all seem to like to say. And I'm sure that from your own self-absorbed point of view, you feel as though you're all alone in the great wide world. That your troubles are completely overwhelming. But I have to say that I'm less interested in catering to your adolescent whims and more concerned that you grow up someday to be people who are capable of considering the feelings of others, for example, the feelings of the person who receives such a thoughtless message in the middle of the night. To be honest, I doubt that anyone who was truly despondent, who was actually considering doing something drastic, would send an email to announce the fact to her teacher. You may have guessed by now that I was never the sort of teacher who thought about her students 24 hours a day. There was always someone more important to me. My daughter, Manami. As you know, I was a single mother. Shortly before Manami's father and I were planning to be married, I learned that I was pregnant. We were a little disappointed that it had turned into a shotgun wedding, as they say, but the truth is we were delighted at the prospect of having a baby. I began getting prenatal care, and we decided it would make sense for my fiancé to have a physical as well. Quite unexpectedly, the tests revealed that he was suffering from a terrible disease, and all talk of the wedding stopped at that point. Because of the illness? Of course, that was the reason. Was it hard for him to accept? I'm sure it was, Miss Isaka. And of course some couples go ahead and get married even though one of them is ill. They choose to face the problem together. But what would you do in this situation? What would you do if you found out your boyfriend or girlfriend was infected with HIV? HIV, the human immunodeficiency virus, better known as AIDS. But most of you already know all about this from the novel you read for your summer project. So many of your book reports said that you had cried at the ending that I decided to read it for myself. For the few of you who chose another book, it's about a girl who contracts HIV while working as a prostitute and eventually develops AIDS and dies. What's that? You don't think the story is that simple? You found the woman, the heroine, more sympathetic than I made her sound? I can understand that, but if you sympathized with the girl in the book, why did so many of you push your chairs back just now when I told you what happened with my fiancé? If you're so sympathetic to people with AIDS, why did you move away when you found out that the teacher standing in front of you had sex with someone infected with HIV? You look particularly uncomfortable, Miss Hamazaki, sitting here in the front row, but there's no need to hold your breath. HIV is not spread through the air. The fact is you can't catch AIDS from most kinds of physical contact, not from shaking hands or coughing or sneezing. 
not from the bath or the swimming pool, not from sharing dishes or from mosquito bites or from your pets. In general, not even from kissing. You can't get AIDS from living in close contact with an infected person, and no one has ever caught it simply by being in the same class with someone who was infected, though I know the book didn't mention any of that. And I apologize for keeping you in suspense, but I'm not infected, either. Don't look so shocked. It's true that sexual intercourse is one way of spreading HIV, but not every act of intercourse results in infection. I was tested during my pregnancy and the results were negative, but because that seemed so hard to believe, I was retested several times. It was only later, when I learned the real infection rate from intercourse, that I understood why I had escaped, but I won't tell you that figure since I know how easily influenced you were by statistics. If you want to know, you're free to look it up yourselves. My fiancé contracted HIV overseas, during a wild period in his life when he hadn't cared much what happened to him. I'm afraid I found it difficult to accept this part of his past. It had been a terrible shock to learn that the man I was planning to marry was infected with HIV, and despite the tests I continued to worry that I was infected, too. Even after I was sure that I was safe, I lay awake at night worrying about the baby in my belly. While I never stopped respecting my lover, I have to say that at times I truly hated him for what he'd done. And I suppose he could sense that. He apologized to me repeatedly and pleaded with me to go ahead and have the baby. But I have to say that the thought of ending the pregnancy never crossed my mind. Irrespective of politics, it felt like murder to me. I should also tell you that my fiancé didn't dissolve into self-pity after learning he had AIDS. On the contrary, he seemed to feel that he was simply suffering the consequences of his actions, and he was always careful to distinguish between his situation and that of haemophiliacs and others who had contracted the virus through no fault of their own. Still, I can't imagine the despair he must have been feeling. Eventually I realized I'd been wrong partly because I so much wanted my baby to have a father and I told him that we should go through with the wedding, that as long as we both understood the situation, we would find a way to face the problem. But he refused quite stubbornly. He was strong-willed, and he was absolutely determined to put the child's happiness above all else. Prejudice against people with HIV is terrible in Japan if you want proof. Just remember how you all held your breath a moment ago when you thought I was infected. Even if the child turned out to be HIV negative, how would she be treated when it was learned that the father had AIDS? If she made friends, would their parents forbid them to play with her? When she was old enough to go to school, would the other children or even the teachers mistreat her and try to force her out of the cafeteria or gym class or anywhere they thought a problem might occur? Of course. A child with no father can also experience prejudice, but the challenges are much less serious and she has a much better chance of finally winning acceptance. At any rate, we decided to call off the wedding. I was left to raise our daughter alone. After she was born, Manami was tested and turned out to be HIV negative as well. You can't imagine how relieved I was. I made up my mind to give her the best care a mother could, to protect her at all costs, and I poured every ounce of my love into her. If you were to ask me which was more important, my students or my daughter, I would have answered without a moment's hesitation that my daughter was far more important. Which was, of course, only natural. Manami asked me about her father only once. I told her that he was working very hard, so hard he couldn't come see her. And this was, in fact, quite true. Having given up the right to call himself one of his father, he had thrown himself into his work as though the rest of his life depended on it. But his sacrifice was meaningless in the end. Manami is no longer with us. When Manami turned one, I put her into daycare and returned to teaching. In the city, daycare centers will keep a child until late into the evening, but out here in the countryside, even extended care ends at six o'clock. So I consulted a placement service for seniors looking for part-time work and found Nissa is taken Arca. She lives just behind the school swimming pool. Yes, that's right, 
the house with the big black dog named Muku. I'm sure some of you have fed Muku your leftovers from lunch through the fence. At 4 o'clock when the daycare center closed, Missa is taken Aku would go to get Manami and keep her for me until I finished work. The two of them grew very attached to one another. Manami loved Missa is taken Aka and called her granny, and she loved Muku, too, and was very proud of the fact that she was often given the job of feeding him. This arrangement continued for three years, but at the beginning of this year, Missa is taken Aka fell ill and went into the hospital. Because we had been so close, I felt uncomfortable looking for a replacement simply because she was laid up for a few weeks, so I decided that I would go get Manami from the daycare center myself until Missa is taken Aka got well. In general this worked well enough, since they were willing to keep Manami until 6 o'clock and I was usually able to wrap things up at school by then. But on Wednesdays, our faculty meetings often went later. So on those days I would get Man Army at 4 o'clock and have her wait for me in the nurse's office. Miss Nato and Miss Matsukawa, you often played with her while she was there, didn't you? I'm truly grateful to you for that. She loved those afternoons. She told me that you girls said she looked like her favorite cartoon character, Snuggly Bunny. She couldn't have been more delighted. Please don't cry, girls. Those are happy memories. Manami loved rabbits, and she loved anything that was soft and fluffy. So of course she was crazy about Snuggly Bunny though in that she was no different from most of the girls in Japan, even those in high school. Just about everything she owned, her backpack, her hankies, her shoes, even her socks, had his little face printed on it. She would climb up on my lap every morning with her little snuggly bunny hairbands and ask me to make her look like bunny, and on weekends when we went shopping, she would always spot some new sort of snuggly bunny product that made her eyes sparkle. About a week before Manami died, we had gone out to the shopping center. There was a Valentine's display with all kinds of chocolate, including a whole selection with especially cute packaging probably for girls to give to one another instead of to boys. Manami was drawn to the display and immediately spotted a snuggly bunny-shaped bar of white chocolate that came in a snuggly bunny-shaped fuzzy pouch. Of course, she wanted me to buy it for her, but we had a rule that she could only buy one item when we went shopping, and I'd already bought her a snuggly bunny sweatshirt that day, the pink one she was wearing the day she died. I told her she could get the chocolate bunny the next time we came shopping and began to lead her away from the candy. Normally she would have followed me quietly enough. But for some reason that day was different. She sat down on the floor in the middle of the store and began to cry, telling me that she didn't want the sweatshirt and that I had to buy her the chocolate. But a rule is a rule, and I wasn't about to let her get away with that kind of behavior. I told myself I would buy it for her another time, when I was alone, and give it to her on Valentine's Day. I reminded her about our rule and told her that she needed to behave herself. As a mother, I'd had to learn that there was a clear difference between loving your child and spoiling her. But just then Mr. Shit Amura happened to appear from somewhere. You had apparently been watching the whole thing, since you came up and offered your opinion without being asked. You seemed to think I was being unreasonable to deny Manami something that cost only 700 yen. Fortunately, Manami was embarrassed to have you see her sitting on the floor having a tantrum, and she immediately calmed down and stood up. Okay, she said, puffing out those little cheeks, but next time I'm getting it for sure. Then she gave you a smile and a little wave and we left. Of course. With Manami gone before Valentine's ever came, I regret not buying her that chocolate every day. The faculty meeting ended just before 6 o'clock that day. The school nurses attended the meeting, so their office was empty. But several of you girls were kind enough to look after Manami until the school closed at 6, so she never complained about being bored or lonely, and she was always waiting patiently for me when I got out of the meeting. That day, however, she wasn't in the office. I checked the restroom, but she wasn't there, either. 
It was just as after school activities were winding up, and it occurred to me she might have gone to find some of you girls in your club rooms, so I wandered around the school looking for her, not particularly concerned at that point. I ran into Miss Nato and Miss Matsukawa, and you told me that you'd gone to play with Manami in the nurse's office around 5 o'clock but that she hadn't been there. You'd thought she hadn't come to school that day. Then you helped me look for her. It was dark by then, but there were still a number of people in the school, and they all joined in the search that evening. Mr. Shino, you were the one who found her after you'd finished with baseball practice. You said you hadn't seen her that day but that you remembered seeing her once coming from the direction of the pool, and you went there with me to look for her. The gate was chained for the winter, so we climbed the fence, but the chain was loose enough to let someone as small as Manami slip through. The pool was full, even though swimming classes were over for the year. The water was cloudy and dark it had been kept in case it was needed to fight a fire. We found Manami floating on the surface. We pulled her out as quickly as we could, but her body was icy and her heart had stopped. Still, I continued to call her name and perform CPR. Despite the shock of seeing Minami's body, Mr. Shino went right away to call the other teachers. Manami was transported to the hospital, where she was pronounced dead. The cause of death was determined to be drowning. Since there were no injuries or any sign that she'd been attacked, the police concluded that she had fallen in accidentally. It was already dark when we found Manami and I was terribly upset, so there's no reason I should have noticed this, but I did remember seeing Muka's nose poking through the fence that separated Misa is taken Arcus yard from the pool. The police investigation turned up breadcrumbs in that area, from the same sort of bread they served at Manami's daycare center. Several students testified that they had seen Manami in the vicinity of the pool, and it became clear that she had been in the habit of going there every week. The neighbors were taking care of Muku while Misa Iztakanaka was in the hospital, but Manami had no way of knowing that, and she may have thought that the dog would starve if she didn't bring him the bread. She must have been worried that I would scold her if I found out, so she always went alone and tried to avoid being noticed. According to the students who had seen these little excursions, she was never gone more than 10 minutes or so. Of course, I had no idea about any of this. When I would ask her what she did while she was waiting for me, she'd give me a mischievous look and tell me she'd been playing with some of you girls. I should have realized then that she was hiding something and questioned her more. If I had, she might never have gone to the pool. Manami died because I was supposed to be looking out for her and I wasn't vigilant enough. I am truly sorry, too, for the shock it caused everyone here at the school. It's been more than a month now, and I still reach out on the futon every morning, expecting to find Manami curled up next to me. When we went to sleep at night, she would always push up against me, making sure that we were touching somewhere. And if I pulled away to tease her, she would reach out toward me again. When I relented and took her hand, she would relax and drop off to sleep. I find myself crying now each morning when I reach out and realize that I will never again feel her downy cheeks or her soft hair. When I told the principal I would be resigning, he asked whether it was because of what happened to Manami, which is just what you were wondering earlier, Miss Kaitahara. And it's true that I've decided to resign because of Manami's death. But it's also true that under other circumstances I would probably have continued to teach in order to atone for what I'd done and to take my mind off my misery. So why am I resigning? Because Minami's death wasn't an accident. She was murdered by some of the students in this very class. I wonder how much you know about the age limits society imposes on certain things, and how you feel about them. For example, how old do you have to be to buy alcohol and tobacco? Mr. Nishio? That's right, 20 years old. I'm glad you're aware of these rules. People are legally considered adults when they reach the age of 20, and every year the TV news covers the crop of newly minted citizens as they drink too much and make fools of themselves at New Year's, when they celebrate their majority. Now, it may seem odd that these young people are all over indulging right on cue right at this one moment in their lives, 
and of course the fact that the TV cameras show up to film at them has something to do with it. But it's also true that this whole spectacle would probably never have developed if we didn't have the rule that people aren't allowed to drink until they turn 20. The fact that society permits the consumption of alcohol at 20 doesn't mean it actively recommends that its members drink or get drunk. Nevertheless, the legal age limit for drinking no doubt plays an important role in promoting the notion that you're somehow missing out on something if you don't drink once you're old enough to do so even if you don't particularly feel like drinking in the first place. Still, I suppose the age limit does serve some purpose without it. Some of you might actually be showing up drunk for class here at the middle school. And I suppose some of you couldn't care less about the law anyway and have already started drinking, perhaps at the urging of an uncle or an older friend. So I suppose it's too idealistic to think that people can be left to develop their own sense of ethics. But maybe I'm being too vague. Maybe you can't see what it is that I'm trying to tell you. Or rather, you're so busy wondering who the murderer could be that you can't think about anything else. You may feel a little afraid to be here in the same room with someone who was capable of this kind of crime, but I suspect it's really your curiosity that's got the better of you now. I can also tell from the looks on your faces that some of you may have guessed who the murderers are and some of you actually know. I have to admit, though, that what shocks me is to see the murderers sitting there so calmly while I'm up here saying all this to you. But perhaps shocks isn't quite the right word. I suppose I'm not really shocked at all. Because I also know that one of the two murderers actually wanted his name to become known. While the other, the one who went pale a few minutes ago when I said I knew what they'd done, looks as though he's about to faint. But don't worry. I'm not going to reveal your names now, in front of the class. You all know something about the juvenile law, don't you? The law was written with the idea that young people are still immature and in the process of becoming adults, so when necessary, the state, in place of parents, needs to find the best way to rehabilitate those who commit crimes. When I was young, this meant that a child under 16 who committed a crime, even if it was murder, was handed over to family court and usually didn't even end up in a juvenile facility. But that view of children as pure and innocent seems outdated now. The juvenile law got turned on its head in the 1990s when 14 and 15 year olds began to commit the most horrible crimes on a regular basis. You were just a few years old, but I'm sure many of you have heard of the incident in Kobe where a young man, still a child himself, killed several other children, beheading one of them. I'm sure the rest of you would know what I'm talking about if I mentioned the name that the killer used in the threatening notes he wrote. That case and others like it started a debate about the need to revise the juvenile law, and in April of 2001 a new version was passed that included lowering the age of criminal responsibility from 16 to 14. But most of you are 13. What, then, does age mean, exactly? I suspect you remember a more recent incident, the story of the poisoning of that whole family last year. The young girl who did it was just your age, 13, and in her first year of middle school. During summer vacation she started mixing some sort of poison into the family dinner and then writing in her blog about any changes she noticed in her victims. But it seems that the effects of the poison were disappointing, so she ended up adding potassium cyanide to the curry one evening and killing her parents, her grandmother, and her little brother, who was just in fourth grade. You may remember the last line on her blog, Cyanide did the trick. The newspapers and TV were full of this story for weeks. That's right, Miss Onezaki, it was called the Lunacy Incident. I'm sure you recognize that name. In Roman mythology, Luna referred to the moon or the moon goddess. The word lunacy itself came to mean insanity or psychosis or even foolish behavior. The TV and newspapers picked up on the word because she had used it in her blog, and there was speculation that she must have had a split personality. How else would a quiet, serious young girl turn into the insane moon goddess? The whole thing became a media circus. And I suspect some of you know what became of her, what sort of punishment she received. Despite the publicity and the fancy name given to the case. 
Because she was a minor, she was never identified and no pictures ever appeared in the press. All we had were exaggerated reports of her crime and vague conjectures about her dark mental state, and the whole thing faded away, with the truth completely unknown. But does that kind of reporting, that sort of public information, seem adequate? All it succeeded in doing was planting knowledge of the existence of this sort of utterly inhuman criminal in the minds of some of our young people and encouraging that pathetic minority of their peers who already admire or even worship that sort of senseless criminal. If you ask me, if we're going to suppress the names and photographs of underage criminals, we should also prevent publication of the flashy aliases they assume to advertise their crimes. She called herself Luna C on her blog, but since she could only be identified as Miza in the press, perhaps they should come up with some sort of humiliating alias for her blog name as well. They could blur over Lunacy or replace it with Loser or Idiot. In the same way, for that beheading case in Kobe, we should have been laughing at that pathetic boy's pretentious use of fancy characters and ridiculous designs for the signature in his notes. I wonder what sort of image comes to mind when people try to imagine what the lunacy girl looks like. Think about it for a moment. Would a beautiful young woman call herself a lunatic? If the law says you can't print a picture of an underage murderer, why let people imagine someone pretty? Print a fake picture instead of a hideous, grinning, evil-minded lunatic. Why not show exactly what this sort of human being is like? If we choose instead to coddle them and make a fuss over them, aren't we just fueling their narcissism? And won't there be even more foolish kids out there to idolize them? Above all, when a child commits this sort of crime, isn't it the responsibility of the adult world to handle it as discreetly as possible and to make the criminal understand its seriousness in no uncertain terms? That lunacy girl will spend a few years in a juvenile facility somewhere perhaps write an apology of some sort, and then be released back into society knowing she literally got away with murder. You may not know this, but the harshest criticism during that incident wasn't for the girl herself but for the science teacher at her middle school. I'll call him T to protect his privacy, but it was well known that T was an unusually conscientious teacher whose primary concern was his students' academic achievement and that he had complained more than once that the science curriculum was becoming obsessed with safety, to the point where only innocuous, harmless experiments were allowed in the classroom. Did I know him? Actually, I had a chance to talk with him at the National Middle School Science for just a few days before the incident became known. The girl told T that she had left her notebook in the classroom and asked whether she could go pick it up. He was in the middle of a parent-teacher conference, and since the girl was a good student and well-behaved, he'd handed her his whole key ring without a second thought. It later came out that she'd bought most of the chemicals in her poison cocktail at the local pharmacy or online, but she'd gotten the potassium cyanide from school and T was universally condemned for being too lax in managing such a dangerous substance. It didn't stop there. There were even ugly, false rumors that he had tempted the girl, led her on, and he was soon forced out of his job. He's still suffering the effects even though the media attention has died down. His wife, who couldn't deal with the endless slander, is in a hospital somewhere for nervous exhaustion, and his little boy has adopted his mother's surname and gone to live with an aunt in another prefecture. Not long after, a notice went out to all the science teachers from the school board ordering us to make inventories of all controlled or potentially hazardous substances. Strictly speaking, you don't need potassium cyanide in a middle school science lab, and, though T might have had his reasons for keeping it around, I can understand questioning his judgment for surrendering the keys so easily. Still, while we don't have potassium cyanide here at our school, We've got lots of other things that could be used to kill someone. We do keep the key to the chemical locker in a cupboard that students don't have access to, but if someone were willing to shatter the glass on the door, who could say what might happen? Even if you eliminated every dangerous chemical, you'd still have the knives in the cafeteria kitchen, and the jump ropes out in the field house. Even those could be used to strangle someone. Nor do we teachers have the right to confiscate your property, 
Even if we're quite sure you have a knife, you may be bringing it with the express purpose of hurting a classmate, but if you simply say you are carrying it to protect yourself from a bully on the way to school, we have no recourse. And if we report our concerns up the line, we're told we should just be more vigilant. Only when your knife causes an accident or is used to hurt someone do we finally have the right to take it away from you. But it's too late by then, and inevitably someone will criticize us for not preventing the tragedy if we knew about the knife. Who is really to blame here? Is it really the fault of negligent teachers? Was Minami's death really my fault? What was I supposed to do? Minami's funeral was private and as quiet as possible. I know a number of you wanted to attend, and I'm sorry that we could not invite you. Part of me wanted to have a large number of people present to say goodbye to her, but I felt even more strongly that it was important to allow her father to be there. They had only met once before, at the end of last year. I hadn't even realized it had happened until I was watching television with Manami one evening and she suddenly pointed at the screen. I met that man yesterday, she said. I thought my heart was going to stop. When I asked her what she meant, she said that the man had been outside the fence at her preschool, apparently watching her as she played on the swings. He had gotten her attention and waved for her to come over to the fence, so she went. She'd been surprised that he knew her name, and he asked her whether she was happy. When she said she was, he had smiled. I'm glad, he told her and then he had walked away. I'm quite certain that the man was Minami's father. The security at the preschool has been tightened recently, and even residents of the neighborhood are checked out if they're seen lingering too long outside the fences. Still, Minami's father would hardly have aroused suspicion. And even if someone had stopped him, he could have made up some sort of excuse. And as soon as he was recognized, he would have been invited right in as a famous teacher. After hearing Minami's story, I started wondering how her father was getting along, and for the first time since we'd parted, for the first time in five years, I called him. That was when I learned that he had finally begun to suffer from the symptoms of AIDS. The character in the book you read fell ill almost immediately, but in reality the virus often has an incubation period of between 5 and 10 years. In his case, it had taken almost 14 years which is apparently remarkably long. At any rate, I wasn't quite sure what to say when he told me, but before I could answer he promised in a lifeless voice that he would never try to see Man Army again. There was no trace in his tone of the energetic man you see on TV. I asked if he would like to go away somewhere with Man Army and me over winter break. It wasn't an offer made out of pity for a dying man. I simply wanted to spend time as a real family but he declined in the same lifeless tone. The first time he ever hugged Manami was after she was already dead. He came to watch with me the evening after she died, and he held her and wept and blamed his past sins for what had happened. They say you can only cry until your tears dry up, but that never seemed to happen to us. We found ourselves hoping in vain for an end to the tears, and bitterly regretting that we had never made time for the three of us to be together. It seems that I've been telling you a great deal about my regrets this afternoon. After the funeral, a great many people came to our house to pay their final respects. Her preschool teachers and classmates, and so many others. We asked them not to bring the traditional condolence money, but they brought snuggly bunny dolls and candy and left those instead in front of Minami's photograph. I'm sure she sleeps easier surrounded by her favorite bunny, or so I tell myself. Missa is taken Aka came to visit me just last week, as soon as she got out of the hospital, exactly a month after Manami died. She knelt in front of our household altar and wept and apologized to Manami's spirit. She had read in the local papers that Manami had crept into the pool area to feed a dog, and she was devastated by a sense that she was somehow responsible for Manami's death. Since the incident had occurred on school property and because I was so exhausted, I had let the principal check the newspaper story before it was published rather than doing it myself, but after seeing Missa is taken Aka I regretted that. There they are again, more regrets.
Missa is taken. Arka had gathered up all the things Manami had left at her house and brought them to me in a paper bag. A change of clothes and underwear, her chopsticks and spoon, stuffed animals and a few small toys. But among these familiar objects, which were now painful mementos, was one that was not so familiar. A pouch in the shape of Snuggly Bunny's head made out of soft velour. It was the one man army had begged for at the store, the one I had refused to buy her but what was it doing in Missa is Takenaka's bag? Man army had always told me when Missa is Takenaka or anyone else had given her something, even if it was no more than a piece of candy. The pouch, Missa is Takenaka said, had turned up in Muka's dog house, which might explain why it was frayed in places. But she had worried that Manami would miss it, so she had brought it to put on the altar despite its condition. I thanked her for all the kindness she had shown Manami and for coming to see me before she had fully recovered, and then I drove her home. Muku was playing with a baseball in the overgrown yard. Missa is taken Aka said that the ball had come from the school, but it struck me as unlikely that even the best batter on the team could have hit a home run that would have cleared the nets and the pool and landed in her yard. She explained that she had sometimes seen students who were cleaning the pool area after school playing catch on the pool deck, and that the ball was probably theirs. The punishment for minor infractions at school was clean up duty at the pool or the sports sheds. And I had forgotten that some of you in this very class had received this punishment during the past few months. Was Man Army alone at the pool that day? I suddenly began to have my doubts. Back home, I took a closer look at the snuggly bunny pouch. Had it really belonged to Man Army? If so, who had bought it for her? As I held it in my hand, I realized it was oddly heavy. Unzipping it, I discovered what seemed to be a metal coil visible under the thin cloth of the lining. Fighting back a horrible suspicion, I went to school the next day and brought in two students for separate interviews. From the noise in the hall it sounds as though the other classes have let out. If any of you have club activities or have to go to cram school, or if you simply want to leave, please do so. I know this has been unpleasant and that I've gone on a long while now. What I have to say from here on out is even more unpleasant, so if you don't want to hear, please leave. No one? Then I'll take that to mean that you are all staying of your own free will. I'll call the two killers and be from here on. There was nothing in particular that drew my attention to her in the first months he was here at school. Apparently he had managed to impress some of the other boys in this class, but I didn't know that and I didn't notice him until after the midterm exams during the first quarter. He scored a perfect 100%, and, since he was the only one in the entire grade to do so, his scores became known not just to those of you in his homeroom but to other classes as well. I know that most of you were proud of him, but I found out that there was some grumbling in those other classes. A comment made by another child, let's call him C, was reported back to me. C had apparently gone to elementary school with her, and he said that I had an unfair advantage since he was doing live experiments. I was disturbed to hear this, so I had C come talk with me in the science room. Before he agreed to tell me what he knew, he insisted I tell no one else. Then he described A's activities during the last year of elementary school, how he had gathered stray cats and dogs from the neighborhood and Using a device he invented and dubbed the execution machine, he had tortured and finally killed the animals. At first C had spoken quietly, looking down at the desk, but as he talked he got more and more excited. He took pictures of the dead animals and posted them on his website. He concluded, as if describing his own exploits, and I remember shuddering to see how much he admired what I had done. I had him tell me A's website address before he left, and then I went straight to the computer in the teacher's office to have a look. There was nothing there but a message in a forbidding font saying that a new machine is currently under development. There had been nothing about any of this in the files that were sent over from the elementary school when I started here, but I took the precaution of phoning his sixth grade homeroom teacher. No, I never heard anything like that. He was a serious student and his grades were excellent, 
he said, apparently unconcerned by Michael. In the weeks that followed, I kept an eye on it, but he was, as I'd been told, a serious boy who seemed to have a good attitude toward school and life in general all in all, a model student and before long I went back to paying very little attention to him. You can call me naive, but I suppose I had my hands full elsewhere. One day toward the middle of last June I was alone in the science lab preparing an experiment for the ninth grade class when it came to see me. He examined the lab equipment with apparent interest, and then he asked me what I had studied in college. When I told him I had majored in chemistry, he asked how much I knew about electrical devices. I had done courses in physics as well, but remembering that his father owned an electronics shop, I told him that I doubted I knew as much as he did. At this, he suddenly held out a small, black imitation leather coin purse with a zipper. It looked perfectly innocent, the type of thing you could buy anywhere. I wondered what he wanted me to do with it, but when I looked up he was leering at me. Open it, he said. There's a surprise inside. I knew it was a trick of some sort and took it from him very carefully. It seemed a bit heavy for its size and I was sure there must, in fact, be something inside. Telling myself I wasn't going to be shocked by a frog or a spider, I gripped the tab on the zipper, but as I did a strong shock went through my fingers. For a moment I thought it was static electricity, but I quickly realized that was unlikely on a rainy day in June. As I stood looking at the purse and my fingers, I spoke up. Pretty amazing, isn't it? It took me more than three months to make. He sounded proud of himself. Still, the shock wasn't as strong as I thought it would be. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. You mean you are using me as your guinea pig? What's the big deal? He said, still grinning and as calm as ever. Don't people take drugs or get shocked all the time for chemistry and biology experiments? As long as you control the amount. I remembered what C had told me, and that A's website said his new machine was under development. Why are you making a dangerous thing like this? I asked him. What are you planning to do with it? Kill small animals? My fingers were still tingling from the shock. I made an exaggerated show of being surprised, like some comedian miming astonishment. Why do you have to be so touchy? He said. I can't believe you don't see how great this is. Just forget it. I'll show it to someone else, someone who'll appreciate it. He snatched the purse out of my hand and left. At the faculty meeting that week I reported that I had made a purse with an electrified zipper and explained how dangerous it could be, and I relayed what C had told me about A's activities in elementary school. But they seemed to think I was talking about something equivalent to a static shock, and the principal just said to give him a stern warning and be vigilant. I also called A's house to talk with his parents, not to accuse him but to let them know that his experiments could be dangerous and ask them to keep an eye on his activities. His mother didn't take kindly to the call. I'm impressed you have so much free time to be calling me about this, she said, her voice dripping with irony. Especially since you've got your own child to look after. I started checking A's website daily. I was sure that when he'd said he'd show it to someone else, what he'd really meant was that he'd post it there. But the site continued to say the device was under development. The next week I showed up again with the purse, a thick file, and a paper, which he wanted me to sign. It turned out to be an entry form for the National Middle School Science Fair, the one advertised in the poster at the back of the room. The deadline was the end of June. Since the projects were due before summer vacation, I had simply mentioned the competition briefly in class. It had never occurred to me that he would want to enter his purse. In the blank for the title, he had written, Theft Prevention Shocking Coin Purse. Under Objectives, to protect my precious allowance from thieves. The blanks were all filled in except for the name and signature of the project advisor. From the project design section of the entry materials in the file, I could see that he had added a safety catch to the purse that would allow the owner to handle it, while anyone trying to open the zipper would be shocked. There was also a detailed explanation of the design and manufacturing process, with elaborate illustrations. 
At the end, he had written about the remaining problems, primarily the fact that the purse would deliver only a single shock. He proposed to continue working on the design as he developed college-level, specialized knowledge, and he concluded with what I took to be an intentionally childish flourish. I'll keep trying to improve my invention until even my grandmother can use it with peace of mind. The application was written out by hand, though I knew I had a computer at home, and I could see that it had been carefully calculated to suggest the earnest efforts of a middle school boy. I know you didn't really help me with it, I said, after I'd had a quick look at the application. But I have to have someone sign it, and you're my homeroom teacher and you teach science. Please? When I hesitated, looking down at the entry form, he went on. I made it for all the right reasons. I just want to protect kids' stuff. But you say it's dangerous. Why don't we let the experts decide who's right? It sounded like a challenge, almost a declaration of war. In the end, he won and I lost. The theft prevention shocking coin purse received the governor's award at the prefectural level and went on to the national competition. There it was lavishly praised and took honorable mention in the middle school division, the equivalent of third place in the whole country. I called A to the science lab to find out the truth about Minami's death. At the time, I thought I could actually accomplish something by doing this. I suppose I was trying to deal with my own feelings of guilt. He came around noon, after a half day of school, with an innocent grin on his face. I held out the snuggly bunny pouch. Open it. There's a surprise inside, I told him, repeating his invitation to me, but of course he refused to touch it. A shame, really. I had made my own improvements, increasing the power to the level of a stun gun. It wasn't difficult to do. With a little research, Anybody could make something like this, the real question is why anyone would want to. When he realized why I had called him, he began telling the whole tale in a tone that was almost triumphant, as though he had been waiting for this day all along. The coin purse that he'd taken to the science fair was, as I'd suspected, the prototype of his execution machine. When he'd finished the first model, he had tried it out on his video game friends. They'd been impressed but not enough to satisfy a he wasn't showing them a jack-in-the-box. They were incapable of understanding what he'd accomplished, so he decided to show it to someone who could appreciate it. That's when he brought it to me. My reaction did satisfy him, but that was a misunderstanding on his part. It wasn't the purse that had frightened me but himself, his whole way of looking at the world. But he was convinced the purse had scared me and intentionally provoked me before he left, thinking I would spread the word about his dangerous invention to the other teachers and his classmates. He was mistaken again. I did report the incident, as I've said, but no one else seemed the least bit interested. It occurred to a, of course, that he could present his invention on his website, but he was afraid no one would understand it, so he decided to take it to people who could properly appreciate it. That's how it came to be entered in the science fair. The judges were mostly professors with impressive titles from technical universities, and I fully expected these experts to be appalled by his lethal entry and to label it and him a menace. In this way he would have attracted the attention he so desperately wanted. But he hadn't wanted his project to be rejected on these grounds in the local, preliminary rounds, so he had crafted the accompanying materials to suggest that a childish, that is, age-appropriate sense of justice motivated the booby-trapped purse. But he had apparently done his job too well, and both he and his invention were seen as perfectly wholesome right through to the national finals. One of the judges at the national level, a well-known professor who has appeared on TV quiz shows, came up to us as he was standing by his exhibit in the hall and told him how impressed he was. I couldn't have put together something like that myself, he apparently told him. The crime-stopping shocking purse had attracted attention as something a bit different in a sea of robot helpers of one sort or another. But I misunderstood again. He thought he was being praised for his technical skills, an understandable misapprehension for a child to have. He still wasn't being recognized for the dangerous villain he wanted to be, 
but he took some satisfaction in being interviewed by the local newspapers. When I saw his picture and read about his success, I was somewhat relieved myself. I felt that he had only wanted a little recognition and attention, and that now that he'd gotten it, he might develop in a more positive direction. I decided that I had been unnecessarily concerned and that everything had worked out in the end. One day late last summer, the local newspaper printed a long article about A's project and the science fair. But that same day the lunacy incident broke and the front pages were filled with the story. In the days that followed, the TV and the weekly magazines talked about almost nothing else. A's achievement was acknowledged in front of the whole school at the opening ceremony for the second quarter, but the fact that he had been praised by the famous professor and that the newspaper had written about him was hardly mentioned. The lunacy incident was all anyone could talk about. What did a care that they had said good things about him? No one had even noticed. And what was so great about the lunacy thing? Potassium cyanide. It wasn't as though she had discovered it who couldn't use a deadly poison to kill people. I had invented his own murder weapon. Shouldn't that get a lot more attention? But the more the media made a fuss over lunacy, the more jealous I became, and the more he threw himself into developing his execution machine. From the time he first entered school, B was a friendly, sociable child. He was pleasant and mild-mannered, exactly what one might expect of someone who had been carefully raised by his parents and two sisters, who were quite a bit older. When I had finished my interview with her, I called B to try to get him to meet me at the pool. Of course, from the meeting place itself he must have guessed my intention, and I was asked to come to his home instead. When I arrived, B said he wanted his mother to join us. She seemed surprised by my sudden appearance, from which I guessed that she had no idea what her son had done. I agreed that she could be present, and we began talking about B's experiences since he had first started middle school. He had joined tennis club during his first quarter. He'd been interested in trying a sport, and tennis had struck him as cool. But once the club had started, he discovered that it was already unfairly stratified. The kids who had played tennis in elementary school were almost immediately allowed to play on the courts, but those who had never played were relegated to a course of fitness training, and even after several weeks had gone by they still had never so much as touched a racket. B was in the latter group, but since it included more than half the kids, he hadn't been particularly upset. After a couple of months of practice, he was allowed to actually play and he had started to like the way he looked carrying the racket case back and forth to school. At the start of summer vacation, their coach, Mr. Tokura, divided them into skills groups again and posted a practice regime for each. The groups included offensive skills, defensive skills, and the like, but B found himself once again grouped with the kids who were assigned to work on fitness skills. Where still, while each of the other groups had six members, there were just two others in B's fitness group, D, who stopped coming to practice almost immediately after the groups were posted, and E, a small, slender, pale boy who was known by the unflattering nickname, Kathy. Day after day, B and Kathy ran laps around the school. Convinced that his own level of fitness was no worse than the kids in the other groups, B felt himself growing more and more frustrated. One day a girl from another club asked him why he was running all the time if he was in tennis club. Thoroughly humiliated, B went to coach Tokuro and asked to be moved to another group. The coach asked him whether he objected to the running itself or to being seen running with Kathy. It was, of course, the latter, but B couldn't tell the coach how he felt. If you're always worrying about what other people think, You'll never get any tougher. Stick it out, the coach told him. We'll be finishing group practices in another week. But the next day B's mother phoned the school to say he was quitting tennis, and soon after that he started attending an extremely competitive cram school all the way in town. B's grades had never been better than simply average, but by the time we started the second quarter, he had moved quite a bit higher in the class rankings. 
His scores on the midterms were nearly 15 points higher than those in the first quarter, and at the cram school as well, where the levels were divided by class standing. In two months he had jumped from the lowest group, class 5, to class 2, second from the top. F, whose grades were roughly the same as B's, started going to the same cram school in November. F started in class 4. Puberty is a time when a child's abilities, whether in academics or sports or the arts, may suddenly begin to develop at a rapid pace. Seeing these successes, the child may then develop a certain self-confidence in that field, which in turn encourages increased effort and increased success. Of course, it also happens in many cases that the child overestimates his abilities, or, like an athlete who encounters a slump, the child often develops rapidly only to reach a plateau where the rate of increase tapers off drastically. It's what happens next that really matters. Some children, convinced that they've reached the full extent of their abilities, stop trying and allow themselves to follow a downward curve to mediocrity. Others calmly continue to make the effort, regardless of results, and manage to maintain themselves at that level. But still others dig in and overcome the obstacle and eventually manage to move up to the next level. Those of us who serve as homeroom teachers for students preparing for the high school entrance exams are used to hearing parents tell us that their child could succeed if he would just try. But more often than not, the child they're speaking of has reached this juncture and followed the downward curve. It's not so much that he hasn't tried, he's simply no longer even in the game. B. 2. Arrived at this moment in his development. By the time we were ready to go on winter break, his grades were no longer improving and had even been to go down a bit. At the start of the third quarter, he was subjected to a pep talk by his cram school teacher in front of the whole class, something right out of a TV commercial. You let yourself celebrate what are a too soon. A few as and you started to relax and it's right back to the old B's and C's. B found the whole experience humiliating. What right did the man have to belittle him in front of everybody just because his grades had gone down a bit? But that wasn't the worst of it. When the teacher announced the new class assignments, B was still in the second level, while F had moved up to the top group. He was furious, and when the lessons were over that afternoon, he went straight to the game center to work off his anger and spend the money he had received for New Year's. He was completely absorbed in a game when he suddenly realized he was surrounded by a group of high school students. They tried to take his wallet, he resisted, and when a patrol officer happened by and noticed the scuffle, he was taken into protective custody. As I remember it, the police called my house that night sometime after 11 o'clock. I immediately called Mr. Tokura, the tennis coach. No doubt B was shocked to see him show up instead of me his homeroom teacher and advisor. He asked Tokura why I hadn't come, and was apparently told that it was because I was a woman. B took this to mean that my situation at home made it impossible for me to be there for him. He assumed that I hadn't come because I'm a single mother and my own child took priority over my students. In the car, on the way back to B's home, Mr. Tokura apparently continued the criticism of B that he'd been during tennis practice. So the cram school teacher embarrassed you in front of the class and you went off to that game center. You worry too much about what other people think. When you get out of school, you're going to have to learn to put up with a lot worse than a little scolding. B's reaction that the coach had verbally abused him was typically childish, but I was impressed by the way Mr. Tokura sized up the situation and offered B the appropriate advice. As he was telling his story there in the living room, B's mother had been sighing and murmuring sympathetically about the trials and tribulations of her poor boy. I couldn't help being disgusted by her stupidity, but I also found myself becoming terribly jealous that she still had a child upon whom to pour all of this misplaced affection. At any rate, though B had been in some sense the victim in this incident, our school strictly forbids students to go to the game center under any circumstances. As punishment for his infraction, B was assigned to clean the pool deck and the changing room after school for a week. At the beginning of February, 
Uh, succeeded in tripling the voltage flowing to the zipper, and he was anxious to test it out. Around the same time, he noticed that B, who sat next to him in class, had been scribbling, die, 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 in his notebook. He stopped B after school one day and asked whether he wanted to see a sex tape he'd managed to get hold of. B had heard about A's tapes and immediately agreed. Very soon after the two of them began spending time together, I asked whether B had anybody he wanted to punish. B was naturally a bit puzzled, but explained about his coin purse and the fact that he'd managed to increase its power. I invented the thing to punish bad guys, so we need a bad guy to try it out on. B knew about the purse, of course, and about his success at the science fair. He'd been impressed, like everyone else in the class. But now that he was being given the chance to see how it worked, he mentioned the first name that came to mind, Mr. Tokura. I rejected the idea out of hand, however, showing what a coward he actually is. He would never act without hiding behind his inventions, and he refused to take on someone as strong as Tokura. B suggested me next apparently out of lingering anger over my having sent his tennis coach to the police station instead of going myself. I rejected this idea, too, no doubt realizing that I wasn't likely to be fooled twice by his little toy. But even worse, he knew I wasn't going to make a fuss over it under any circumstances, which is, of course, exactly what he wanted. At that point, B remembered that he'd seen Manami by the pool when he'd been cleaning the deck. What about Moriguchi's daughter? He asked, and finally agreed. I knew that I had been bringing Manami to school on Wednesday afternoons. B added important details. That Manami was coming to the pool by herself to feed the dog, and that she had pestered me for a snuggly bunny pouch at the mall but that I'd refused to buy it for her. The mention of the pouch got A's attention. The next Wednesday, when school had let out, and B hid in the locker room by the pool and waited for Manami. They saw her come out on the pool deck, produce a piece of bread from under her jacket, and feed it to Muku through the fence. The boys approached her from behind, and B spoke first. Hello, he said. You're Manami, aren't you? We're in your mother's class, and I ran into you at Happy Town the other day. Manami was cautious at first. I realized that she might be worried that they would tell me they'd seen her at the pool, and he spoke to her in a soothing voice. Do you like dogs? Well, so do we. That's why we come here sometimes, to feed the pup. When Manami heard that these big boys were coming to feed Muku, too, she relaxed and dropped a guard, and at that moment I produced the snuggly bunny pouch he'd had hidden behind his back. Your mama didn't get this for you, did she? Or did she get it for you later? Manami shook her head. The truth is, she asked us to go and buy it for you. So here it is, an early valentine present from your mother. I reached out and put the strap of the pouch around her neck, and man army seemed elated at the gift. Go ahead and open it, I added. There's chocolate inside. At the instant her hand touched the zipper, man army collapsed to the ground and lay motionless. A satisfied smile spread over A's face. B was in a state of shock, unable to believe what he'd just seen. Gotcha. He heard a whisper. What happened? He said. His voice was breaking as he grabbed A's shoulder. What have you done? She's not moving. Then go and tell someone, tell everyone, I said. He brushed B's hand aside and walked away with a satisfied look on his face. Left alone, B became convinced that Manami was dead. But he was shaking with fear and couldn't bring himself to look at her body. He found himself staring instead into the eyes of Snuggly Bunny, whose head formed the fatal pouch. If they found out that this thing had killed her, then they'd find out he was an accomplice to murder. Averting his eyes, he pulled the pouch from Manami's neck and threw it over the fence, as far away as he could. Then he thought of a plan. He could make it look as though she'd fallen into the pool. He picked up Manami's body and threw it into the cold, dark water. Then he ran away as fast as his legs could carry him. As he came to the end of his story, 
B added that he barely remembered the events he'd been describing due to the shock he had experienced at the time, but he felt that he'd been honest with me that he told the truth. So this was how Manami really died. And B continued to come to school, despite the fact that I now knew the truth. They saw no signs that the police were about to appear in our classroom. I wondered about this, in fact, when he'd finished his confession, with that almost ecstatic look on his face, he'd asked me as much. Why hadn't I reported my suspicions to the authorities? But I told him that nothing had changed, that it would still be regarded as an accident, and I had no intention of turning it into the kind of sensational murder he had wanted it to be. Then there was B's mother, who had listened to her son's confession with a blank, dumbfounded look on her face. I told her that as a mother myself I wanted to kill both A and B but, I added, I am also a teacher, and though I recognized my duty to report these crimes and make sure they received the appropriate punishment, I had a teacher's duty to protect my students. Since the police had determined Manami's death to be an accident, I told her I had no intention of reopening the case and stirring up trouble. You can imagine that it was a rather noble little speech. I went home, but a short time later there was a call from B's father, who had heard the whole story when he returned from work. He wanted to discuss some sort of monetary compensation, what they call a solatium, but I wouldn't hear of it. If I took money from his family, B would feel that the whole thing had been put to rest. But I want him to reflect on what he's done and to lead a better life from here on, without ever forgetting his crime. And if his father finds it necessary to be around a bit more to support his son when his past is weighing heavily on him, well, all the better. Now that is a reasonable question. How do I justify letting them go free when it's possible I might kill again? You certainly have been paying attention. I suppose it's a skill you learn from your computer games. Though I have to admit it's hard for me to understand why you got so frantic when I was talking about HIV and can listen to the story of a murder without even getting upset. But you misunderstand when you worry about a killing. Again dot dot you see, he didn't kill man army in the first place. B did. That night after Missa is taken Arca left, I came back to school and measured the voltage in the pouch. Without going into the details. What I found was that the purse was incapable of stopping the heart of an old person with coronary disease, or even that of a four-year-old child. I tested it myself, and I can assure you that the shock was far less painful than the one I'd had from touching a frayed gourd on my washing machine. I'm convinced that Manami was just unconscious. As I said earlier, the cause of Manami's death was drowning. The next day, when it was reported that she'd been found in the pool, I went to B and asked him why he'd butted in and done something so unnecessary. I suppose I wanted to ask B the same thing, though for different reasons. Even if he couldn't bring himself to go get help for her, why didn't he just run away? If he had, man army would still be alive. I do not want to be a saint. I am not being noble by keeping the identity of and be a secret. I haven't told the police because I simply don't trust the law to punish them. I fully intended to kill Man Army but didn't actually cause her death, while B had no desire to kill her but brought about her death. If I did hand them over to the police, they probably wouldn't even be sentenced to a juvenile institution, they'd be let out on probation and the whole thing would be forgotten. I wish I could electrocute a drown be like he did my daughter. But neither punishment would bring back man army. Nor would they be able to repent for their crimes if they were already dead. I wanted them to understand the value, the terrible weight, of human life, and once they'd understood, I wanted them to fully realize the consequences of what they had done and to live with that realization. So how was I supposed to accomplish this? I know someone who lives with this kind of weight on his shoulders. He provided me with some inspiration. If you'll remember, this whole discussion started with the idea of calcium deficiency, but calcium isn't the only thing we lack. In the past, Japanese people had a refined sense of taste, but these days it's said that more and more children can't even tell the difference between hot and mild curry, a problem supposedly caused by a zinc deficiency. So, 
I wonder about all of you. How sensitive are your tongues? And B, specifically, their tongues. It looks as though you all finished your milk, but did any of you notice an odd flavor? Perhaps a bit like iron? You see, I added some blood to the cartons that went to A and B this morning. Not my blood. The blood of the most noble man I know, Minami's father, sent Sakurinami. I can see from your reactions that most of you have figured it out. I'm not sure how quickly my little experiment will take effect, but I would like to urge and be to have their blood tested in a few months. The incubation period for the HIV virus is usually between 5 and 10 years, so that should give you plenty of time to think about the value of life. It's my hope that you'll come to understand what a terrible thing you've done, and that you'll beg forgiveness from an amiss spirit. As for the rest of you, you'll be continuing on together as a class next year, so I expect you to look out for these two and take special care of them. I doubt you'll be sending your new teacher any of those frivolous text messages about the value of living. I haven't decided yet what I'll be doing next. The truth is, I may not have the freedom to decide after today. But if something is to happen to me, I only hope that it will be delayed long enough for me to see the results of what I've done. What's that? What if the results never appear? Well, then, I suggest and be watch out for swerving cars. I am hoping to spend spring break with Minami's father. We've been living together since the accident, and though he doesn't have much time left, we have decided to spend it peacefully together. I hope you have a productive and pleasant vacation, and I want to thank you for the past year. Class is dismissed.